We're talking about Gerard Winstonley, who was born 1609 uh, in Wigan and uh, died in 1676. He was, uh, there were a lot of radicals in the 17th century in England. He was probably the biggest rebel, the biggest, biggest radical of them all. There's much been written about him. Um, I can't uh, summarize all his philosophical and radical ideological views. I will give a very brief summary of that, but I want to focus on, on his family and the influence of Wigan on, on, uh, on him. Uh, he's, he's famous because he espoused a program for radical change, political, social, and re religious change for the country, um, much of which has been passed through in literature and is popular by some groups today. In uh, 1649, he founded a group called the Diggers. They're also known as the True Levelers. And that's because there was another radical group called the Levelers, uh, which was headed by John Lilburn. They, they advocated substantial change, but not nowhere near as radical change as uh, Jared Winston in the Diggers. And he's written very extensively. Um, I recommend if anyone wants to read a short book uh, that's well written and a paperback, it's a book called Jared Winston Lee by John Gurney, and it was printed by Pluto Press in 2012. If you want the full works of Jared Winston Lee, they're available as this, the complete, the complete works of Jared Winston Lee is available for about, I think they're about 600 pounds if you want to buy the full two editions. Some of the ways in which we recognize him today, um, of course, there's the annual Diggers Festival in Wigan which has been going for about 10 years now. Uh, of course, this year was interrupted by the coronavirus events, but it started off 10 years ago uh, in the Pear Tree. And I gave the first talk on Jared Winston Lee, that, uh, that first meeting. There's also a memorial to Jared Winston Lee in Belize Square up at the top of the wind. Uh, and I believe in the uh, Museum of Wigan Life, there's now a small display including one of his uh, books. In Crawford Street, we have Jared Winston Lee House, the, the old courts buildings. Um, I don't know for sure, but I've been told that uh, it was given its name in the 1960s when communists were quite active in Wigan. Uh, if any of you have any other uh, knowledge of the naming of that house, I would appreciate knowing. Um, there's much been written in uh, world literature about Jared Winston Lee. A lot of academic researchers, and today there's still uh, new articles come out about Jared Winston Lee each year. Uh, one interesting uh, evidence of the recognition of his, his activities and his philosophies was an obelisk in Moscow. And here it is. Um, in, 1913, I think it was, uh, an obelisk was erected to uh, commemorate the 300th anniversary of the Romanov dynasty. Um, back in 1918, of course, things changed substantially in Russia and they demolished that and erected a new monument, an obelisk to the key socialist thinkers throughout history. And at the top, as you would expect, there's Marx and Engels. And if you come down one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four. One, two, four, five, six, seven, eight. This is apparently Winstonly in, uh, in Russian. And below that, interestingly, uh, here is Thomas Moore. Uh, some of you might know the major work that Thomas More wrote called Utopia back in, I think it was 1516. So uh, we've taken a look, a brief look at his philosophy and his actions. He basically said everybody is born equal. There's no difference between uh, the king, the, the leader of the church, the lord of the manor, 
uh, of the peasants. Everybody was born equal and should be treated equally. And he, his famous um, commitment is that the earth should be regarded as a common treasury for all, not for the use and profit of just a few. And the diggers, of course, cultivated common land. I'll say a little more about that later. Uh, he, he completely wanted to overthrow the existing social, economic, and re religious practices. Uh, he wanted to get rid of the lords of the manor, private property, uh, no wages, no buying and selling of goods for profit. People should be contributing to their own uh, needs and be allowed to uh, obtain what they needed without uh, profit for anyone. He rejected all organized religion. Uh, once he started his radical activities, he never referred to God again in his writings. He referred to what he called reason, which he interpreted, or it seems that he interpreted to be an inner God um, that each person had within himself or herself the, the ability to uh, sort out their own life and develop their own salvation. There's no need to be dependent on an outside external being or God. And rather than any beliefs or teachings, he said that people should rely on their experience and reason rather than being told what to do at school or learn what to do in church or by anybody else. So what do we know about his formative years? Uh, very little. It's a huge mystery. All the academics uh, recognize there's almost a complete lack of knowledge of his family. We do know his father, and I'll, I'll bring that up later. And in, interestingly, in all his writings, all his books, all his pamphlets, he never once mentioned Wigan or his family. And the academics have really acknowledge that the source of his radicalism is largely unidentified. So what follows, I'll try and identify some of those gaps, particularly his family and some of the influences that uh, Wigan probably had on him. So what do we what do we know about him? We know he was baptized in Wigan in October 1609. Uh, all this is documented in the uh, Wigan registers. His father was Edward Winstonley, who we know was a mercer, that's a, a cloth merchant. Nothing is known about his mother. In those days, in the registers, only the father's name was given. So it's very difficult to find anything about uh, other members of the family. When he was 21, he went down to London and was apprenticed at Merchant Taylor's Company, obviously to become a, um, a more accomplished cloth merchant. Uh, and in 1638, eight years later, he became a freeman of Merchant Taylor's Company. And he set up his own cloth business in London, which was reasonably successful, but not, nothing really outstanding. While in London, he married Susan King, who was daughter of a, a pretty well-established, famous London surgeon. After a few years in business, he became bankrupt in uh, 1643. And uh, a lot of activities went on, but he ended up moving down to Surrey, where he worked as a cowherd, an overseer of the poor, and a church warden. Uh, what's important, while in Surrey in 1648, he went through what I'm calling a midlife crisis and what he called enlightenment. That's, that's what really turned him around when he became the radical person that he was. So going back to his family, uh, we know he was born in Wigan in 1609. So the first thing I did and other people have tried to do was go through the Wigan registers, the first ones from 1580 to 1625, to see if we could find the father who gave a birth to a son called Edward Winstonley. And rigorous look at those records indicates that's not, not feasible. There is no one in Wigan who could have given birth to Edward in 1609. No one born in Wigan who could have given birth to Edward in 1609. So you have to look outside Wigan 
outside Wigan Parish. And some birth records are available in uh, parishes, particularly to the south and west of Wigan, uh, Warrington, Prescott, uh, Windle, and so on, Ormskirt. And I, didn't, I couldn't find anything that was convincing there. So I looked at the uh, wills, uh, Chester wills. And there something very interesting came up. There was a Thomas Winston when he died 1593. I don't know exactly when he was born, who married an Alice, uh, Alice Winston. Thomas was clerk and late dean of Warrington Deanery. That, Warrington Deanery was part of the Diocese of Chester. Wigan was in the Warrington Deanery. So he obviously had a substantial rank within the Protestant church, probably uh, fairly influential and certainly very knowledgeable about uh, the Wigan parish. In his will, he dedicated his, uh, his property that he owned and his land to, to excuse me, to his uh, children. And it gives the names of his children, Thomas, Alexander, Sicily, El Elizabeth, and Edward. So we have an Edward, the son of Thomas. Um, so that's a distinct possibility uh, to being the father of Jared, because we know Jared's father was an Edward. And Edward, interestingly, is an unusual name in the Winstonley family in those days. The common Winstonley names were um, Edmund, William, um, uh, James, and so on. So following the possibility that this Edward was um, Jared's father, uh, there was an Edward married an Isabel in Prescott in 1593. Um, he was probably born around, I'm guessing, around 1575. And the records in Wigan Register shows that Edward died in 1639. He was a mercer. We know Edward's, uh, Jared's father was a, a mercer, and he was a burgess in Wigan. When he died in 1639, he was also titled Mister. So that puts him at a substantial social level to be called Mister. So as, as well as giving birth to Gerard in 1609, Edward gave birth to Humphrey, Alice, and Ellen. So these would have been Jared Winston, his brothers and sisters. These would have um, been his aunts and, aunts and uncles. The, what gives me confidence to believe that these are the grandparents and parents of, of uh, Jared are the actual names, Edward and Jared. As I mentioned, Edward is a very unusual name in the Winstonley family. Um, it was probably that he was named by Thomas, his, Edward's father, after Edward Fleetwood, who was rector of the Lord and Lord of the Manor in Wigan from 1571 to 1604. Gerard, interestingly, who was Edward's son, most likely was named after Gerard Massey, who was again rector and Lord of Manor of Wigan in 1604 to 1616. So this shows that the this branch of the Winston family were very closely tied in to the, uh, the to the church and rectory in Wigan. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about some of the important people in Wigan at the time of uh, leading up to Jared Winston's birth and about the time when he was living in Wigan. Going back. You're all familiar with Winstonley Hall um, that was built, uh, six, sorry, 1555 to 1561 by Thomas Winstonley and his wife Elizabeth. Uh, when Thomas died, his son Edmund inherited the hall and estate. Uh, Edmund married, but they never wanted to live in Winstonley after a few years. And in the 1560s, they went back to Wales, where Edmund was actually born. So Winstonley Hall was pretty um, uh, not occupied very much for a couple of decades. The person in charge of Winstonley Hall, a steward of the hall, was Thomas's brother, Edmund, 
who was Edmund Winstanley's uncle. So that was Uncle Ed. Uncle Ed was also a steward of Wigan Parish Church. So again, showing a very close link between the Winstanley family and the running of, of Wigan Parish Church. And Uncle Ed married Mary Langton, who was daughter of Sir Thomas Langton, Baron of Newton. The Baron of Newton had been the avowson of Wigan Parish Church for hundreds of years. So this is a, demonstrating the fact that the Winstonley family married very deeply into some of the very important people in, in Wigan. Um, Mary's brother was Richard Langton, who was son of Sir Thomas Langton, and he was also a rector and lord of the manor in Wigan uh, uh, in about mid, uh, mid 1500s. Some important people were not directly members of the Winstonley family, but were very influential in the running of Wigan and I'm sure in Jared Winstonley's life. People like James Banks, who bought Winstonley Hall in estate from James Banks, from uh, Edwin Winstonley in 1596, for the amount of £30,000, which today will be about eight and a half million pounds. James Banks was from Wigan and he earned his wealth uh, as a gold merchant and banker in London. Henry Mason was another Wiganer who was very closely connected to the people who established uh, Gerard Winstonley as uh, apprentice in the Merchant Taylors Company. Hugh Bullock, who I'll say more about later, people like Francis Sherrington, who's well known in uh, being a benefactor of Wigan Grammar School. Um, Sherrington's sister Susan had also married James Banks. So these people were very closely intertwined, sometimes intermarried, and established strong ties down in London, so, which I'm sure helped Gerard Winstonley as, as he uh, moved from London to being a, um, a student at Merchant Taylor's company. So Hugh Bullock, in, interestingly, as, as far as I can tell, was the first Wiganer to be admitted to the Merchant Taylors Company back in 1587. And there was another person, Richard Winstonley, who became a freeman of the Merchant Taylors Company in 1628. So that was before Gerard Winstonley. So what we see is, is roots of uh, connections from Wigan to London, and particularly the uh, Merchant Taylors Company. Interestingly, uh, Hugh Bullock, uh, recognized as a Wigan haberdasher, was granted two and a half thousand acres in Virginia, in this country, back in 1634. He, he, he came, he obviously became his own captain of his own ship and first went to Virginia in the early 1620s. So he would have been one of the earliest settlers in this country. And after that, he returned to London and gave the land in this country to his son. Background to Gerard Winstonley's uh, radical activities in the late 1640s, 1650. Uh, we're all aware that England was going through a civil war, or rather civil wars, during the 1640s, where the authority of the king and the church were severely challenged by the people. England was still very much a, a feudal system with the uh, king or queen at the top, the barons, and so on below, with a lot of um, peasants and people with no land of their own at the bottom. There was, however, an emerging merchant class with growing capitalism. And Winstonleys themselves, I've alluded to briefly, um, they made the money that allowed them to build Winstonley Hall by becoming wool merchants in Wales back from about the late 1400s to mid 1500s. So they were well established in the merchant uh, uh, cloth trade. And obviously, Gerard Winston, his father, was a cloth merchant, and they obviously wanted Gerard to become a cloth merchant. There's also a lot of religious changes going on the Reformation, the abolishment of the Catholic Church in England, establishment of uh, Protestantism as the main religion. There were many struggles with new religious groups being formed. Uh, it was a time of the scientific revolution. Uh, Sir Francis um, Bacon, of course, was very instrumental in establishing the scientific methodology. Uh, there were 
in the late 1640s, there were also periods of severe drought and food shortages and radical social groups were popping up all over the place, including uh, the diggers. So by the late 1640s, Winston was pretty much bankrupt and poor. He hit rock bottom. And then in 1648, he wrote that he had a trance where he was, his, his ideology and his philosophies were totally changed. A lot of people have tried to interpret this trance in many different ways, forms of religion and mysticism. I like to keep it simple and say it was just a process of deep meditation and soul searching, uh, which people who are at the rock bottom uh, often do. You either don't come out of it or you come out with a shiny new light. During that deep meditation, he would have questioned every aspect of his life from growing up, going to London, marrying, becoming a cloth merchant, etc., etc., And he would have questioned what was going on in the religion and the politics in the country. And he determined, remembering that he himself was now a, a poor man, he would have appreciated uh, uh, what it meant to live in poverty. And the, he, he decided that the only way to get out of poverty for everybody was a complete overturn of the social, political, and religious system. And during this uh, deep searching, he would have recalled his upbringing in Wigan. So going back to the history of Wigan, leading up to a very important event in 1618 that I'll get to, um, it's important to recognize that Henry III granted Wigan a royal charter and freedom in 1246. Uh, there were burgesses who were classed as free tenants to the rector as long as they paid their rent. They had a one and a quarter acres of, for their own burgage and they had the right to common pasture, timber, stone, and clay on the, on the land that belonged to Wigan. Over the next few centuries, there was constant struggles between the rector, who was also a lot of the manor, and the Wigan burgesses and the corporation about these rights. Um, interestingly, Bridgman, who wrote the history of Wigan back in 1888, said he knew of no other instance where the joint roles of secular priest and lord of the manor provided such complete powers. It was extremely unusual that the rector was also the lord of the manor, but that combination gave, gave him um, a lot of power over the people living in Wigan, which at the time would have had a population of about 5,000. And to point to one of the points, one of the um, points that Jared Winston made, a lot of the people were in into the senior post in religion, not just because they believed in God, but because it was um, a well-paid job and they, their income was substantial. For example, John Bridgman, who was rector of Wigan and became Bishop of Chester in 1619. His salary, his income in 1619 was about a thousand pounds, which was about 250,000 pounds today. So that led up to what happened in 1618. Remember in 1618, Jared Winston was still in Wigan. He would have been about nine years old. And the Wiganers were successful in elevating their disputes with the rector and Lord of the Manor to the king, to King James I. Imagine today if, if some disputes in Wigan were successful in raising to, uh, to the queen for, to get some resolution. The king appointed four arbiters, the Archbishop of Canterbury, the Bishop of Eli, and two chief justices. They concluded that the rector should continue to own the manor, including the wastes, the common lands. However, the freeholders and all the inhabitants should have access to and use the wastes, including digging for clay and coal. Uh, clay was particularly important because there were a lot of potters in Wigan, and it's important that they were allowed to dig clay and coal was just being started to be dug and became very important for the development of Wigan. So as Jared Winston looked back at his time in Wigan and what was going on and what he learned, he would have realized that Wiganers through the concerted union action acting together by elevating their claims, earned the right to use unfarmed common land and that land was a common treasury for all. So in 1649, Jared Winston Lee and the band of diggers 
started digging and cultivating common land in St. George's Hill and Cobham in Surrey. They typically grew a variety of vegetables. There were, I'm not sure how many people, eight or nine in the band that uh, became the diggers in, uh, in Surrey. Other bands of diggers were established in other counties such as Northamptonshire, Kent and, and Buckinghamshire. However, the diggers' activities only lasted for about 12 months. In 1650, Cromwell's men came and uh, expressed their desire that they uh, take the hook and go somewhere else. And the local residents, of course, were not very happy with this band digging up the land uh, close by where they lived. So despite only lasting 12 months as, as the digger activity, Winston Lee continued to publish very prolifically. So going to the question of why Winston Lee never mentioned his family or Wigan in his, his tremendous amount of uh, books and pamphlets and, that he wrote. So let's have a look at what we know. His family in Wigan and the Wigan area owned land and property and made money from buying and selling land, property and goods. For instance, Winston Lee Hall, Winston Lee Estate was sold for a fortune. Uh, Jared's father was a mercer who bought and sold goods for profit and so on. Jared Winston Lee, however, now believed that everybody was equal and the earth was common property for all. Uh, Gerald Winston and his family were Protestants, as we've seen, very strong, active in the church. Gerald Winston, after his enlightenment, decried all organized religion and believed in this reason, of the inner um, religion. Uh, Wigan, of course, was a strong loyalist uh, stronghold. Gerald Winston wanted to abolish the monarchy and supported Cromwell whose forces sacked Wigan and Latham House, which was the stronghold the home of Lord Derby. So you, you can imagine why Winston Lee, Jared Winston Lee didn't want to go back to Wigan or mention his family when his views were now totally antithetical to, to what they had and ha held in, in Wigan. Later in life, um, after after 1652, he returned to Cobham in Surrey and he actually became a Quaker. He was probably buried a Quaker. In 1665, he married his second wife, Elizabeth Stanley, and they had two sons and a daughter. As far as I can tell, uh, the two sons died before their mother died and the um, daughter probably did also. So I'm not sure whether any of his children actually had children of their own. That's not, not to be de not determined. He also became a corn chandler in London and overseer of the poor uh, church warden and chief constable in Surrey. So he had a complete turn of uh, beliefs again. <laughs> I guess he gave up on everything he'd, he'd been preaching for years. Whether he did this in order to be embodied back in society or whether he became a true believer, I guess we just don't know. One interesting fact was that several legal cases he was involved in, his lawyer was James Winstonley of, of Gray's Inn. James Winstonley came from Winstonley. His mother lived in um, Huff Wood, which was a detached part of Winstonley and Billings. Uh, as far as I can tell, but I can't prove conclusively, this James Winstonley was a descendant of James Winstonley, who was brother of Thomas Winstonley, who beat Winstonley Hall. This James Winstonley did very well, but uh, as a lawyer in London, and in the 1650s, he bought Bronston Estate in Leicestershire and uh, married into Boodler. So Gerard Winstonley died at the age of 66. And after that, he was largely forgotten until his writings were uh, revived by Russian communists back in the late 1800s. And we've seen a subsequent recent surge in activities uh, associated with, uh, with his beliefs and ideologies. So today he's still very much remembered and there's still a lot of uh, research going on about him. But I think we've contributed here to a better understanding of his family and why he 
never mentioned his family or Wigan in his writings. So that's that's where I'd like to end. It, 